Over a month ago now, I found one of those large commercial printers sitting on the side of the road and I could not resist the rescue attempt. It took me almost an hour to get the thing in my van and then it took two days to take it apart. So what I'm going to show you is just a snippet of some of the work that went into tearing it down and then also what it looked like along the way. Then we'll come to the workbench and I'll show you the things that I decided to keep. All right, let's get to it. All right, we're kind of making some progress here, but this thing has something like 10 million screws. I'm gonna turn the camera off for a few minutes, then I'll catch you guys up. That way the sun doesn't go down before I'm finished. Okay guys, there is no way I'm gonna get to all the goodies in here in one day. I've only got maybe an hour or so of sunlight left. I'm gonna take as many screws out as I can and then we're gonna finish this guy tomorrow. There are quite a few interesting components. I don't even know what they are yet, but I'll take a look at them and see. One other thing that I wanna point out while I'm here is on the ends of all the shafts, there's these little plastic clips. These are snap rings. I'll take all these little snap rings off and just put those in one box together. That'll make it easier to get all the shafts out. If you wonder why they're hard to pull out, it's because there's probably a snap ring on the other side holding it. And then also the brass bushings that are on the end of the shaft, I'll do the same thing. I'll keep all these in a box and because I want to keep these guys. Well, as you saw, that printer was quite massive and it takes a lot of effort to move it around and take it apart. So I'll show you again just a sample of some of the things that I have taken out of it. Some of these I'm only keeping long enough to show you here in this video so you kind of have an idea of what's there. But I tend to favor the mechanical components and those are the kind of things that 
I usually keep. But as you can see, there are quite a large number of steel shafts. They vary quite a bit in size. And uh, if I have measured carefully enough, there seems to be a mix of both metric size shafts as well as uh, US customary. Uh, for example, there's some shafts that I'm pretty sure are 5 16 and not 8 millimeter. But you want to be sure that you match up your bearings and such accordingly. Uh, these really large shafts I may use in some of my machine projects that I make. Some of the small shafts I have used for many of my small mechanical machines that I make. For example, I recently finished making a clock. Uh, all the gears are made out of wood. Now I'll put a little clip up here for you so you can see it running. It keeps time and it was a really fun project. If you would dare to take on something as complicated as that, I have made plans and you can see that stuff on my website. So here's a bronze bushing, uh, again for all the various sizes. And then some unusual size bearings, which I'm gonna keep for a little while if I can find a use for it. If it's really small like this, I'll store it in a box and I'll keep it. But large things that I don't have a plan for, I usually go ahead and throw those away because I don't wanna have like stuff piled up everywhere. Uh, more sleeves and bushings. Some of these are lock collars like this guy here. Uh, magnets are another thing that I use a lot. This magnet I pried out of the hard drive that was in the printer because I use so many magnets in my projects. In fact, I also use magnets all over the shop this magnet comes out of a microwave and I use this to hold my tools right above the workbench. And so again, it's right above the workbench so it's easy to just grab it and pull it down. So this magnet will be no different because of its size. I will probably use this not to hold a tool but I, I might use this inside one of my small mechanical machines that I make so frequently. So those are the bearings and bushings. Again, all the different sizes are here, generally from four millimeters to eight millimeters, but there are a couple much larger ones for these really big shafts. There are also these heavy duty mechanical hinges with these big springs in there. So I have a project in mind that I wanna do for this where I need a really heavy duty spring and so I'll keep this for a little while. I've got two of these. Some of the smaller circuit boards have these transformers and these other components here. Uh, I haven't had a chance to look all these up, but I plan to research these before I throw these away because some of these components may be useful. My general rule of thumb for salvaging is if it's connected to a heat sink, all of my projects usually require some kind of high current capacity. So I will investigate the ones that are screwed down to a heat sink and see if they might be useful to me. For example, this one has a part number of 24N50 and I will look that up and see what it is and whether I want to keep it. But I do all that off camera. I, won't, I will spare you the details there because I want people to actually watch my videos. There are a large number of these brushless DC motors. Some of them are fans like this. We can make sure this guy still works by just hooking it up to 24 volts DC. Whenever I do a salvage like this, I always set up some batteries right next to my workbench. Just a little tinkering tip there so that I can quickly test components like this and make sure they work. Circuit boards like this, I will also go through and see if there are any electrical components I want to keep. As you can see here, there are more components attached to a heat sink. This capacitor though is another thing that I use a lot of and because of its high capacity, 200 volts and 2200 microfarads, I will keep that guy as well. Now this thing I took out of one of those slide out doors from the tray. As you can see, it's got a stepper motor here, another DC motor here. I have no idea what it did. It's some kind of feeder maybe. Uh, hopefully this part is in focus here, but there's a worm gear on this side. I'm going to wire this up and tinker with it just because mechanically it's so interesting to me, although I am sure I have no real use for it. All right, now we're getting down to the cool stuff. So electric motors I love. This is not an electric motor. <laughs> this is a massive circuit breaker here, and I would definitely use this guy for 20 amps as a 
frequent tinkerer. I am constantly tripping the breaker inside the house. I will use this guy so that I can trip the breaker out here instead of in the house. Another thing that was really cool is all of these solenoids. Now, this solenoid is basically a coil of wire that produces a magnetic field. And that magnetic field can be used to repel or attract uh, a steel shaft. I think I still got one. There it is. So as you can see, this one was used to actuate an arm inside the printer. And I've got 24 volts sitting on the side over here just for this purpose. And there you go. So the whole idea is this would actuate an arm. And I'm going to keep a couple of these, especially the large ones, because I have uh, a couple of cool ideas in mind. I will use this small one for like a mechanical pinball machine idea that I have. So that'll be coming up pretty soon. Well, not soon, but that's one on my long list of things that I want to make. And then these larger ones I might actually use in one of my more robust machines in the shop. And it will be nice to be able to flip a switch and have something actuate into place and then release that switch uh, for it to unlock and lock. But what I wanted to show you is actually all of these stepper motors. Now you can see here these two are mounted together with the timing belts. There is a large number of these motors inside of the printer and this is not all of them. This is just a sample. This one is a brushless DC motor here with the circuit board. But as you can see some of them are pretty large. Now this is the kind of thing you will find in a CNC machine because it allows you to get very precise movements and repeatability. You can go back to the same spot over and over again. In my opinion, stepper motors are really only useful for machines that require precise movements. Other things make them difficult to use like the kind of odd voltage. This one, for example, operates at 2.1 volts and also they require special circuitry in order to run them. Uh, you can run a stepper motor without special controls. Uh, in fact, I'll show you that. In order to power one of these stepper motors without a special stepper controller, you're going to need to get the proper voltage and you're going to need a capacitor. Uh, in this case, this stepper motor requires 24 volts DC. Of course, I'm going to run it with AC, but you'll see that in just a second. The 24 volts, I don't want to just plug this guy directly into the wall. You also need to take a moment to figure out which coils in the motor are connected together. And that's how I have already sorted out these wires. Now, I was going to explain how to do all that in this video, but that was going to make the video kind of long. And there's already a good video on this on YouTube. So I'll just hook it up for you real quick. And then I'll put a link in the description to the other video that explains that process in more detail. In order to get 24 volts, I've got this transformer that I took out of a treadmill. The black and white one is for the primary winding, which is 120 volts from the wall. And then the output side, according to this, will give me 16 volts, but it actually gives me closer to 20 volts. All right, if I remember correctly, the speed should be about 300 RPM, 299. Again, there's a link in the description to a guy who's already done an excellent job of explaining uh, why I have this set up the way I do. But hopefully you found something useful here and I will see you guys pretty soon. Thanks for watching.